challenges in the rainforest. Um, they are important sinks of carbon for us on the planet, but as we've had some climate change happening, there have been changes happening in these rainforests as well. Um, and they can have, as I said up here, profound effects on the ability to continue to absorb carbon in the atmosphere. So I would like to be able to monitor these changes in the, rain, in the rainforest, and I think that I will be able to get a grant to do this. But when you go to do a grant proposal, it really helps if you have some preliminary data. If I could show that I have made a prototype of what I'm thinking of to do these measurements. Now, I can't do these measurements on the ground because I'm actually interested in what's happening in the canopy of the rainforest. So that means I need to have some sort of a system to get my equipment up off the ground. I also need to put some people up there because the equipment doesn't is not automatic, so it needs myself and probably some of my graduate students to go up there. So I need to support some weight up there as well. So we have a plan to go to Brazil, to the canopy of the rainforest there, and I want to build this tower to support my measurement equipment. I need to support at least 2,500 pounds, but I'm not, not sure if I might be able to get up to 5,000 pounds, depending on the equipment that I have, how many students are willing to go with me, et cetera. So my ideal thing would be that I could support up to 5,000 pounds. And really, the range where I want to be able to uh, do these measurements is 98 feet to 148 feet. So again, I need something that's off the ground that can support uh, some weight that would be able to then put my equipment and things in. So I'm really hoping that you can help me because I feel like if I go right now with my proposal, I might not get funded because my competitor over there has a whole team of, of people working on doing a prototype for him. So I'm hoping my team is better. So uh, Dr. Donovan assured me that you could help me with this challenge in a very short amount of time because my proposal is due very soon. <laughs> Hence your 25 minute uh, time limit. All right, so you're safe with us. We, we got this. All right, so in the allotted time, 25 minutes, I want each team to attempt to build the tallest possible prototype of this tower to support about 25 to a maximum of 50 models. Now, of course, as Dr. Climatologist said, money is a big issue here. So we really need to do this using the least amount of materials possible. So the kit that you all have, actually, I want you to now, you can feel free to explore that kit. Don't think of them if you're at a table. Don't think of them Now, these materials were well selected so that they represent what the real types of uh, materials that are going to be available in Brazil, in the rainforest, where this tower needs to be constructed. So you're going to have with you the marbles, which are going to be used to represent the load, the students, and the equipment. You have the paper cup, so that's actually going to be what you're going to use where the, the people are going to be supported, so that paper cup is crucial. You have to have that cup as part of your prototype because your marbles must go into the cup. Modeling clay and paper clips are just used as adhesive materials to help you to build the structure. The most expensive material that we have are going to be our straws. And you have two types of straws. So you have the long red ones, those are the most expensive. They're going to be about $1,000 per real type of building equipment. And then you have a slightly cheaper material that's about $500 per stroke. So remember, again, we really want to make it the cheapest possible, but we still need to get to that height, and we still need to support between 25 to 50 models. Now, a few other things. The paper plate serves as foundation. You don't have to use it, but if you do, it can only be at the base of the tower. And I'm just telling you right now, so your straws came in wrappers. That's kind of like the wrapping that comes with your supplies. Those can't be used in the tower construction. Thank you. 
sheet, and that's going to give you all these data points that you need to know. I remember So just to get your attention and one more time. Now, one inch in your tower is equal to six feet in the real tower. So bear that in mind. All right, so without further ado, let's go. just off the coast of Venezuela. We are not a Spanish-speaking country. I know sometimes people say, oh, do you speak Spanish? <laughs> we don't. Uh, we're an English-speaking country. Uh, and one of the things we're most known for um, is our carnival. And I will tell you something that people tend not to know, that limbo actually came from Trinidad and Tobago, not Hawaii. <laughs> 
Um, so my area of expertise is really engineering education. So I tend to study how people learn um, and get into the field. Uh, particularly, I'm really interested in the pathways towards this degree. So I do a lot of work in sort of K through 12 engineering. So being on this grad is really just the thing I, I, I love to do. So I'm really excited to work with you. Uh, I got my degrees at uh, Morgan State University, which is a historically black um, college, and then my PhD from Purdue University in Indiana. Uh, initially, I started off in electrical engineering, like Kathleen and you hear from Dr. Climatologist. <laughs> uh, and then I got my master's in industrial engineering, which is the field that I currently teach in at the University of San Diego. Uh, but as I said, my PhD is in engineering education, which is a relatively new field really focused on understanding how people learn and teach and interact and you know, become professions in engineering. Uh, some of the things I'm really interested in, um, I'm really big on humanitarian engineering. And that's something that I will probably discuss more in this grant in terms of how do we really begin to use engineering for the betterment of humanity. And that's something I really feel that could be instrumental in the next generation science standards. I mean, one of the things I'm really excited about is that we say engineering kind of brings that social justice aspect to NGSS because now students can take their science learning and apply it to problems that are relevant to them. And so that's really the part that excites me about the role engineering can play in NGSS. So if anybody wants to talk more about that, um, you know, I'm happy to engage. Uh, so I do a lot of K through 12 outreach. Um, and one of the other things I'm involved in is the Society of Women in Engineering or Women Engineers. Um, and I'm the advisor for that chapter at USD. picture showed up. So my name is not Carol Climatologist. I'm not a climatologist at all. My name is Susan Lord. I'm a professor also of electrical engineering like Kathleen. Uh, I'm from the East Coast, so I live here for a reason because the weather is so amazing. Um, I went to college at Cornell, which is in upstate New York, and I did a major in electrical engineering and material science and engineering. I liked the part of electrical engineering that was the application of math, but using math for a reason. And then I really liked um, material science because I felt like it was the application of chemistry for a reason. Um, and I do enjoy teaching both in electrical engineering and our one material science class. Everything around us is made of materials, so sometimes people complain the electrical is hard to see because you can't really see electrons so much, although I do optoelectronics and you can see the opto part. Um, but the materials is nice because we can look at the things that are around us in the room and talk about how they work the way they do. Um, when I went, because I did this major that was both, I could go on either in electrical engineering or in material science, and I chose to go on in electrical engineering, uh, working on optoelectronic devices, so those are things like lasers or photodetectors or LEDs. Um, and then I went and decided that I really wanted to teach. Um, my parents are teachers, my father is a professor, and my mother was a nursery school teacher. I don't know if they had any of the same students ever, but they covered the gamut. My grandparents were teachers, so I felt like it was in my blood. Um, there are many places in engineering where no one really cares at all how you teach. As long as people aren't complaining in the dean's office, your teaching is fine. That's not what I wanted to do, so I chose to come to a place like USD where we have small classes. We actually get to know all our students. We don't have graduate students, so we are in the labs with the students. And I really do enjoy that. And my research, like Odesma's, is also in engineering education. So I work with a very large database so we can look at pathways of students. I tend to look at the pathways in college. Um, engineering has a real problem still in attracting a wide variety of people. Most people's image of what an engineer is is not like any of us standing up here. Um, none of us have pocket protectors. Um, all of us are able to form a complete English sentence. Um, and so, I'm very excited about NGSS having engineering in there because I think that one of the real problems for having such a lack of diversity in engineering is that it's viewed as this elitist thing that you have to be a genius to do it. And I'm certainly not a genius, um, but I've been successful enough to be recognized by several organizations as a fellow. 
without having an oscilloscope in my garage, which is what someone told me I needed to do. I do not think you have to eat, breathe, sleep engineering to be a successful engineer. I think it's not a really welcoming message to kids to say you have to eat, breathe, breathe and sleep this thing or else you might as well do it. So I hope that by giving them messages that some of engineering is doing projects asking kinds of questions, right, that are different than maybe how a scientist asks. And a lot of these questions I think could be very appealing for young folks. So, um, Oh yeah, so I uh, am also the mother of two kids who will have an eighth grader and a 10th grader for another two weeks or whatever. Um, and uh, when they were smaller, they were willing to ride on the quad with me. So my husband's a mechanical engineer and did make that quad bike. Now they are too busy or it's too hot or they're whatever. <laughs> so, um, but engineering is all done in teams and so that is my example of teamwork too. And um, as part of, uh, my experience also, we spent a sabbatical, my whole family, in Nanjing, China, and if you pay enough money in China, they let you hold a panda, which was, you know, the highlight of the whole thing. My daughters went to the local Chinese school, which is tough if you don't speak Chinese, but the day we were standing in line for the panda, they were so excited, like, I can't believe I get to hold a panda! So, so it made almost all of it worthwhile, it was awesome. Our Chinese friends, friends thought we were nuts, you want to pay that much money? Like, yeah, because we can't even pay money here to do that, so, you know. And uh, you never know where your career will go. I certainly didn't think when I was choosing this electrical engineering material science that I would end up writing a book about Latinas in engineering, but I work with a sociologist. And uh, so as part of an outgrowth of our work, we have some quantitative data looking at Latinas in engineering as well as qualitative. And the short answer to that is, although folks did come back and say, well, couldn't you like widen the book? Why don't you have it on like all women in engineering or something? Like the whole point is there's never been a book on Latinas in engineering before. And there's kind of a, stereotype that maybe there are not too many because they're not too good, but that is false. And actually Latina transfer students are the most successful population in all of the data we have with over you know, hundreds of thousands of students. And so being able to study things at a, a, a finer level lets us see some of these success stories because too often a lot of STEM with women and minorities ends up being a doom and gloom story. But there are many of us who have been successful, just not enough. And I'm hoping that all of your efforts early on can help us to have more people think about this and change the profession. So hi everyone, my name is Marin Tespe and I'm actually a rising junior at USD. I uh, was born and raised in Denver, Colorado and then I decided to come out here because it's beautiful. <laughs> and um, I actually came into USD as a computer science major and I was taking both the introductory courses for both computer science and engineering and actually my engineering 101 professor was Dr. Dalrymple and I wasn't having the best time in the computer science department even though I love coding to this day but I was having such a great time in Dr. D's class <laughs> that I was just like I can't I've switched so I ended up switching my major to mechanical engineering and now I'm minoring in math as well and actually just finished my minor so that's cool um, and, USD's been the best choice I've ever made. I got really into engineering right off like the bat. I started, I actually work as an undergraduate researcher under the mentorship of Dr. D, which is why I'm here today. And I also am very involved like on campus. So I got involved in our um, NSBE chapter, which is the National Society of Black Engineers. And now I am our chapter's president. So that was really cool. And um, I was recently, this past year, fortunate enough to be accepted into a program called Semester C. And that is what I will be doing this upcoming fall. And I will be going to 14 different countries around the world and coming back on Christmas Eve, so those are my future plans. But as of right now, I'm just focusing on research and kind of getting involved in the engineering community as much as possible. So that's why I'm doing this and fun things like that. So yeah, thank you so much. So that sort of ends our um, segment. Uh, I think we probably show this probably during lunch, but just to let you know that 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 um, scenario we gave about the climatologist, that's actually really real. I mean, there are towers that need to be constructed to house equipment uh, in order for various uh, researchers to gather information about what's happening in the rainforest. So um, probably over lunch, I'll just kind of have this video playing in the background just to help you see some of the real life applications of what you, you actually did today. So 
Melanie, I turn it back to you. There's, there's so many movies, there's so many stories about why we need engineering, but I wanted to show this to you because I, I really like this one. saving anyone's life at the moment. But tomorrow we're going to also look like that too. We're going to have things on our table. We're going to be working with things. So again, a little bit of history of why we're here. And obviously engineering is important to save lives and it makes a heck of a good movie too. But we're here and I'll explain to you how this kind of started. And you've met some of our partners. You've met our University of San Diego partners. And we'll be in, in, introducing the rest of our partners as today goes by. Okay, so what is this grant anyway? I've had a bunch of you ask me, and it's sometimes I've said just call me and I can explain it. But I think I want to re-explain it to you guys in, in a little bit of a better detail here. Now, there are math and science partnerships going on across the country. My friend who lives in Minnesota is working on one. She's doing something with science and math, and she's doing something with the math, the practices that, the science practice that relates math and science together. They're, they're all over the country. And it was from the U.S. Department of Education, designed to improve content knowledge of teachers and the performance of students in math and science by encouraging state's institution of higher education, which is USD in our case, local education agencies, which is Sweetwater, elementary and secondary schools to participate. And of course, we always, we feel like sometimes science gets left kind of down there somewhere. Go math, go English. Um, but hopefully with our new science standards and a new push for science education, we will, we will be getting a lot more, and that's why I couldn't resist when this was presented to us. And we want to encourage our higher education institutions to work with us and build partnerships. And again, bringing science together with scientists, mathematicians, engineers to improve teaching skills. Provide summer institutes, that's where we are today, and ongoing professional development for teachers to improve their knowledge and teaching skills. So not only are you going to learn about engineering, you're going to be learning about pedagogy in science, how to teach science, how to work with engineering, and how to kind of complete the whole circle. Okay, so California is one of the states, like I mentioned, states can have these. So California Math and Science Partnership Grant Programs, this is administered by um, the Science, Technology, Engineering, and Mathematics Office at the CDE in Sacramento. And it's dedicated to increasing academic achievement of students in math and science. Okay? And it's part of No Child Left Behind um, Title II. Okay, so here's the history of how, why we're here today. Okay, on July 3, I'm at USD. I'm applying for a job to be an adjunct professor there. And I meet the wonderful Dr. Bobby Hansen. 
and she's like, do you know anybody from Sweetwater? We're thinking about writing a grant with them. And I'm like, uh, I'm from Sweetwater. And it was, there you go. So I, if you guys have ever been to USD, it's one of the most beautiful campuses in the world, but you have to hoof it. So there I am, hoofing it, and I'm calling my boss going, Dr. Del Rosario is my boss. I'm calling him going, Roman, guess what? I think we're going to get like millions of dollars in this grant. And he's like, oh God, it's just Melanie calling me. What is she doing? He goes, where are you? And I was like running and excited, and I was like trying to go to, so of course, you know, I was like, please say yes, you know. And we chose science. You know, you could choose math or choose whatever. <laughs> I, as if math was even a word. Sorry, anybody in here that's a math person. So, and then also, history be told, this was about 10 years ago, we were presented another MSP grant. And the, the, the kicker with this is it's due by September 1. Now, we're lucky because we start back to school before then, but not much longer. So I had tried to get a grant with some middle school teachers about 10 years ago, and you have to have 30 people to sign up. I got 22. I begged, I pleaded, it didn't work out. So I was very disappointed years ago. But I didn't know that much about it back then either. So they're like, what are you gonna do? I'm like, I don't know if I can get 30 people. We, I had this problem before. And then I thought, well, you know, I, I don't wanna use the G word, Grossmont. But worst case scenario is I reach out to our neighbor, Grossmont, or some of our surrounding schools and be a nice neighbor and invite them in, but only last ditch effort. So July through August, busy writing the grant with, our, with some of the grant partners, recruiting participants. Okay, so what did I do with some of you? I came up to you and bugged the crud out of you, right? Right? Who did I not bug? All of you. So I bugged you and bugged you and bugged you, and you guys signed up, a little scary, afraid, um, but you signed up. And I emailed you, I phoned you, I cohort and zoned you, okay? <laughs> Sounds like a song. Fax, Fax and I can sing. Fax and I have a, a song <coughs> right Okay, so September 1, the grant was due. And let me tell you, I had to bug the crud out of Manny Rubio. That man did not want to see me. He's our grants director. Oh, yeah, Bobby knows about that. Bobby's like, Bobby, come down, please. Help me with Manny. I have to work with him. Yeah, I was just going to stalk him until he signed the papers. At that point, though, we actually had 68 participants, which was phenomenal, because then we didn't have to call it Grossmont. We didn't have to call him. We're all, we could keep it to ourselves. So in December, late December, we were notified of our selection. Yay! And everybody's like, did we get it? And I'm like, yay. We're like, yay. But then... What does that mean, really? Puzzling to all of us. So in February, I went to Sacramento with Odesma. Yay. And I just sat there like the whole time going, oh boy, what am I doing? It was fun. Luckily, we have another MSP grant. Um, there are several of our middle school teachers involved. Julie Walker, some from Rancho Del Rey. Um, um, they are in another MSP grant with our feeder schools, so, but that we could only recruit 10 of them to, to participate. So that's a really awesome grant. So luckily I knew a little bit about the MSP grants from working with that particular grant as well. So we had fun, but it was a lot of information and got to meet a lot of people. There are some people that write grants every year and they're like, oh yeah, I did this every year. And I'm like, wow. But now I'm realizing that it's a really good thing to do every year. Because once your grant is over, you can write another one and just keep going and learning and learning and learning. So they have the right idea. Then April the 8th, we came here because the Ribbon Fleet Science Center is one of our community partners. And we met with our partners and had a basic kickoff with the professors and just, just an overview um, of what we were doing. Then April through May of 2016. Um, I don't answer anybody's emails either, sorry. <laughs> you guys have emailed me, I'm like, what? I, I don't email you back at that point. I will start emailing you back again after these three days. Um, <laughs> so, selection of teacher leaders. So, there is a, a similar grant in San Marcos, which is kind of fun because there's north and south here. Or, um, and we have, you know, similarities and differences. Uh, we were very far along within GSS, as you guys know that, compared, you've been to some trainings, compared to some of the other districts. We had started early, 
some of you guys wanted to hurt us, but I think now, in retrospect, we're glad that we've moved forward and we are we have a, a good understanding. And I know that it's sitting in this room, some people have a very strong understanding of NGSS and some people don't. So we're kind of trying to get everybody on the same page today. So you may hear a few things you heard before, but again, just like your classroom, sometimes you have to make sure everybody's on the right page to move forward. Now, um, we, had, you know, we had some people move and some different things, and we were able to get some more teachers. So we, the district said they would pay for 10 more teachers to participate. So we added some, some more teachers, and that was awfully generous. So we thank them for doing that. So just the, the more people we possibly could to be in this process. And then um, back to San Marcos, they were like, you know, it might be nice to have teachers who are very familiar, especially us, because we know exactly how far along we are within GSS process. We know, the, some of us know the framework very well. Some of us know what we need to be doing, our instructional guides, our approaches, <laughs> our trainings. So I sent out an email to teachers who would like to volunteer to help out and be a teacher leader. And like by the end of like day two, the first person that emailed me back, I'm like, okay, you wanna do it? Sure, what do I have to do? So the teacher leaders were selected and they're gonna introduce themselves here in just a few minutes. And that's how it got started. And I talked to Bobby Hansen on the phone a lot. My husband is no longer my number one person in the phone, it's Dr. Hansen. <laughs> so, it's just, it's happened like this, and with everybody to come together, and here we are today. So we're, we're very lucky to have had this happen. And you, you just never know sometimes what, what can happen, and, and saying yes can get you, okay? Now, this is, should also be in your folders. Okay, these are our project goals. Now, different grants have different names. And our name is ESP, Engineering Science Partnership. Because it sounds all cool, like you have ESP. <laughs> and our logo is a little brain with the stuff coming out. Like we have ESP at night. We think of, you know, what was it, oscilloscopes? We think of microscopes, PCR machines, all these things. Okay? So that's where the ESP came from. We're, we're a California math and science, and I want to thank Miss Susan too, because Susan's like, what are all these acronyms? And I'm like, oh crud, I'm just like rattling this stuff off like nobody's business, and, and realize, you know, hey, we probably need to go back and have a refocus about what everything means here, so we, we all are, you know, have, have a grasp of this. There's a lot of, a lot of acronyms here. So again, ESP is Engineering Science Partnership, just think of, Oh, have a great idea, ESP. And we are part of a California Science and Math Partnership grant, which is a part of a federal grant, okay? Everybody with me on that? Okay, so that's kind of where we are. Now, our goals are also provided for you in the folder. I think these are important that we, we know these and we kind of look back at what we're doing and why we're here. Well, we know the, the one, number one reason we're here is because of students. That's the most important thing, is our students. And that's why we should do what we do. That, that's definitely the most centralizing thing. So our project goals is to deep, deepen teachers' science and engineering content knowledge and use of evidence-based instructional strategies. Goal two, to improve professional collaboration within and across grade bands. So some of you are sitting at tables with middle school, high school teachers. NGSS spirals the cross-cutting concepts. It starts from kindergarten and goes all the way up. So it's not taught in isolation. And we're not gonna be teaching our engineering either and not be working in isolation. Goal three, creation of a cohort of NGSS <coughs> trained teacher leaders who will sustain and expand upon the work of the grant in years to come. So we all have some big ideas and, and I accept any ideas, talking about how we can use what we've done here and keep going <coughs> with it. Okay, possibly, you know, who knows where we could, what we could end up doing. Okay, now there's the professional development. That's what everybody has wanted to know. 
the teacher intensives. That sounds really serious. <laughs> I've never heard that book called before, intensive. So we are at an intensive today. So there are five in the summer. And I know a Sweetwater teacher only has six, six weeks in the summer. And when you say a five-day workshop to a Sweetwater teacher, that's just bad. So that's a bad word. So what we did, and the CDE are kind of freaking out. What do you mean they're not five days in a row? I'm like, well, I had to explain this to them every time I talked to them. So it was you guys' idea to meet three days and then two days later. So that way it's not completely five days in a row. And, you know, give us a little time to breathe in between then. Go on vacation in between then. So those are our days. Now, I had my, just so you guys know this, I had my dates a lot. When did I? When did y'all first see these dates? I just want y'all witnesses here. Long time ago. Somebody give me a month. December. Yes, I did. Okay, these are witnesses. So all. So why do I need a witness? Because all the district people are like, oh, so we want to do this training with you. We want to do that training with you on the 13th and 14th. Yeah. So anyway, we were first. Just so you guys know. So, those are the dates, okay, and you guys should have those ingrained, but, but I, I understand that some of your schools are doing trainings on those days, but we were first. Okay, five during the school year, so five intensives, five intensives during the school year, September 29 and 30, that's the last two days of fall break, January 5th and 6th, the last two days of our winter break, May 6th is a Saturday. Because I had mentioned to you guys, you don't want to get, it's a sub shortage anyway. So if you know May 6th, nobody should have a problem. Good grief. I told you guys in December, that's like a year in advance. <laughs> that's a little obsessive. I know we're all obsessive with our days, but that's a little crazy. So you know that now. So you can plan. And I understand if emergencies happen, and I appreciate you guys telling me. But again, our emphasis in those days will be on deepening teachers' understanding of three-dimensional learning and the three-dimensional NGSS model, including the integration of engineering and technology practices. Because when we got these standards, we're looking at the engineering going, how in the heck are we supposed to do that now? That was kind of a little, uh, you know. And how many of you, I know I'm going to get one hand at least, besides our professors, how many of you have ever taught an engineering class or worked for any type of engineering organization? I knew Patrick. One, two, three, four. Okay, five. Five people, okay, and myself. That's pretty, that's kind of, and these, these are the best teachers in Sweetwater sitting in this room right here. So extremely talented, five people. So that's, that's pretty, you know, huh. But, but again, now after this, you're going to say, I was in this grand, and I know engineering. So yeah, so it's, it's important and it is a part of our standards now. So that's why we're here is to learn more about how to integrate those engineering practices into our school day in, with our students. So we'll have two PLC meetings, one in the fall, one in the winter, and one in the spring. Dates are going to be given in July because you know what? To be honest with you, I'm not sure exactly when some of the zones and cohort meetings are. I'm not sure exactly. I haven't been paying attention to anything for the last month, though. So um, some of these dates, we just need to get set. Some of the dates for things that you guys are doing, we need to look at the master calendar before some of these get set. And then again, emphasis will be on collaborative peer-to-peer -peer opportunities for teachers to look deeply into teaching and learning. Probably some sort of type of um, lesson study where you not like a formalized one, but maybe where you create a lesson together and then you teach it with your students. Um, so it's some type of, of collaborative learning process. Classroom observation and coaching. One will be in the fall and one will be in the spring. Again, on personalized mentoring and coaching. Not, it's not evaluative for teaching, but we're looking at that awesome lesson that you will be creating. Okay, that's what we're going to be taking a look at. How did the students respond to that lesson that we created? So that, in a nutshell, is the ESP grant. Wow. All right. Now, I think our next up was... 
Okay, we'll do the teacher leaders first. Okay, if you are a teacher leader from Sweetwater, if you will please I'll just have you guys stand up from where you're sitting. Most people know you guys, but we'll kind of have you guys kind of introduce yourselves. And then I have, um, Carrie is on a special project that will be starting a little bit later. We'll have her stand up and she can talk briefly about her special project. <laughs> just, um, I'm Gina Woodard and I teach at Hilltop High School. And um, I am one of, well, I just teach biology. And Andrea and I are, are co-teacher leaders for biology because we have a huge group. So I'm really looking forward to working with Melissa. Hi, I'm Adrian Marriott, the other half of Team Biology. I'm at Benita Vista High. Hi, I'm Shannon Chamberlain from Castle Park Middle School. I teach science, coding, Project Lead the Way, science literacy, whatever they tell me to do. Um, and I am the lead teacher for General Science One. Um, hi, my name is Maria Canales. I teach eighth grade science at Benita Vista Middle, um, and I'm the lead teacher for eighth grade science. I'm Maureen Reimer, and I teach physics at Sweetwater High School, and I'm the lead teacher for physics. Um, I can just use my teacher voice. I'm Rachel Meisner, and I teach chemistry at Casper High School, so I'm the lead teacher for chemistry. Hi, I'm Elizabeth Carzoli, and I'm actually in the science curriculum and instruction piece, and I'll be looking at a lot of the English learner and AP and GATE stuff that uh, we're doing. special education resources. I'm going to continue to add to that some scaffolds, some graphic organizers, some articles, some things like that. But if any of you have any questions about how can we make this a little more attainable for our students with special needs, please feel free to call me, text me, email me, hunt me down, um, whatever. I'm usually hanging out with Melanie, so it shouldn't be hard to find me. But um, this is very exciting for special <coughs> education. Thank you guys. Did you want me to do that wrap now? Hi, I'm Carrie Northam. I teach chemistry and will be doing medical physics next year at uh, San Ysidro. And um, my job here has to do with the phenomena. So if you've spent some time learning about NGSS, uh, you know that it's phenomena driven. And so I'm going to be the phenomena girl where when you have ideas and we all are sort of pooling our resources, I'll be the person who's in charge of sort of organizing and coming up with ways that we can come up with the phenomena to drive NGSS in our classrooms. I got, I got, oh, no. Anna? Uh, she's hiding. I saw her do that. I didn't do a good job. But I'm Anna. I'm gonna, I work right across. I can't see you. Oh. Ah. <laughs> Um, so I work with Melanie at the district office, and I'm going to be helping all of you, and Christine, of course, and Liz, and a whole bunch of other people that are new to the office, um, but I'm going to be helping all of you when you develop your lessons to um, um, make it more accessible for English learners, so I'll make sure that I'm looking for your ELD standards within it, and then how to scaffold for those kids. So that's, that's my job in the back. 